excited for uh, what's to come of my three um, So what we're going to get into today um, is going to be sleep, right? Obviously. Um, so my name is Seth Furman. I'm a uh, in the exercise science department and the uh, sport performance department for the Mother's Day and uh, men's basketball team. And I'm in class of exercise science. So um, I'm a Okay, so. Um, now for me, like kind of why I got interested in some of this stuff is like kind of doing a little reading here and there, um, and then just kind of realized like piecing a lot of things together that like sleep pretty much has an impact on every single thing that you do, every single thing that's going on in your body. So we kind of look at this like picture up here. Um, what we're going to get into is going to be some health aspects of sleep or lack there or lack thereof. Uh, impacts it can have on performance, and then things that we can actually do, right? Because everything that I try to do, at least, are going to be things that you guys can take away. So the first half will kind of be, hey, here's some crazy stuff that can go on and you don't sleep enough, and then the second half will be like, hey, what can we do about it? Okay, so um, now up, <clears throat> up here, one thing that we're looking at is, you know, we notice how like the foundation of this, again, this little uh, picture here is going to be health, right? We can't have high levels of performance if we don't have decent health. Right? If you're sick, if you got XYZ going on, you're probably not going to be super strong, you're probably not going to be super fast, you're probably not going to be in super good shape. Fair? Okay, so that's why kind of we're going to get into um, the health aspects of it first and then build on to that and then we're going to see some uh, things after that. Okay, so um, also, too, like sleep, like all of us, like hopefully, cross our fingers, hopefully we all spend a third of our lives doing it and it's pretty important. Right? So if we spend a third of our lives doing anything, we should probably at least be halfway decent. Right, so um, that's kind of it there. So again, we, I, I kind of think of sleep. I put these a couple other places. Is that like sleep being like the Swiss Army knife of health, right? And we're gonna go into all the things, not all the things, but a handful of things that it can impact. And if we kind of look at sleep through this lens, I think that we're gonna be able to place a little bit more value on, like I said, something that we do hopefully eight, hour, eight hours a day uh, and maybe more. Okay, so, um, going back to that. Okay, so looking at like, well, why do we sleep, right? So we look at sleep in general and talking about like, hey, it's going to impact all these things. Um, and so again, we're not going to go through every single one right this second, but again, we're going to go through these a little bit as we kind of get going, right? So again, if you look at just the overall health aspect, like if one of these things is going to be out of whack, then other things can kind of stem from that, right? Um, and like I said, sleep's gonna have a huge impact on all these things, which again, are gonna drive health, which again, in turn, uh, can hopefully drive performance, depending on how you're training, things like that, right? So, um, also too, a little fun one, appearance. That was kind of a weird way to think about it sometimes. It's like sleep's impact on appearance and how you look. There's some weird stuff that's out there that literally had people who were on lack of sleep and had a full night's sleep, and they had people who had no idea what the study was, judge how they looked, and it was the people who had lower levels of sleep, they judge them as being not as attractive. So, a uh, little side note, if your girlfriend or wife or whatever, uh, or just a significant other, never tell them that they look tired. That's typically synonymous with that you look like crap. Okay, so, as I'm sure some of you guys uh, may have found out the hard way within that, but a little uh, fun thing to talk about there. So, now, so the question becomes like, all right, well, how do we sleep, right? Essentially, what's going on? and why do we get tired, okay? So there's this little like chemical that's going on uh, that's gonna get built up in your brain throughout the day. So when you wake up, it basically starts the clock of like this, it's called adenosine, getting built up in your brain. Um, once that hits a certain level and once nighttime happens, then we're gonna get like a melatonin release and that's basically telling you, hey, you're getting tired now, okay? So now, for this to happen, typically these two things also have to happen. Okay, we'll talk about some things that impact that uh, for sure. So the way to kind of think about melatonin in general, and because I'm sure some of you guys may have taken it or know about it at least, is that think about melatonin being the person who's going to be like starting the race. It's not necessarily the one, the thing that like makes you sleep well. It's basically just a signal that tells your body like, hey, I'm just kind of starting to get tired now. Okay, so think about it that way, and then we'll, like I said, we'll get into some things um, that can impact that and all that. And, all this stuff. So the adenosine buildup stuff, we have a pressure on there because we think you might hear the term sleep pressure. 
basically saying like, hey, we got all this adenosine buildup and we're starting to get tired. <coughs> okay, so typically, again, hopefully 10 p.m., 11 p.m., hopefully not much later than that, uh, we start to feel that pressure and that pressure to go to sleep, but that can be impacted by a handful of things, okay, which like I said, we'll get into uh, here in a sec. So, talk about that. All right, so we have generally two main stages of sleep. Um, there's non-REM and REM sleep, so like non-rapid eye movement and rapid eye movement. So non-REM non -REM sleep has four different stages. Um, typically the function and like why they matter, and looking at non-REM sleep, we think about this as being like the time of sleep when you're reflecting on things, right? So again, within your sleep, within your subconscious, um, storing, strengthening memories, experiences, and stuff like that. Um, and typically this is gonna be the case early on in sleep, right? So when um, you're gonna have more of this non-REM sleep early on, and then as you go throughout the night um, and early on into the morning, then you kind of start to get a little flip-flop. Okay, so we look at REM sleep, um, again, rapid eye movement. So if you ever watch, this sounds kind of weird, if you ever watch somebody sleep, their eyes are shut, and their eyes are literally going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, right? So um, what this kind of does for us is like the integration of past experiences, and kind of gives us an idea of like how the world works, right? It sounds kind of woo-woo a little bit, but that's kind of what's going on in our brain, okay? So um, also with like problem solving type of <coughs> So, and this is typically going to happen later in sleep, or like I said, early in the morning. So, you think of like the time where, uh, you know, maybe around four, five, six o'clock in the morning, depending on when you go to bed. Um, this is going to be a time where your brain is super, super active, and probably when you're going to have some, maybe some gnarly dreams going on through there. So, if you're waking up at like six in the morning, what the heck is happening, right? Not, uh, REM sleep has something to do with that. There's also atonia, which is basically lack of tone, uh, meaning that you're, you guys ever heard of like sleep paralysis? Basically, your body is doesn't. There's no muscle tone. There's no activity going on. And during REM sleep, that happens. So within cycles throughout the night, there's times where your muscles are literally not active, and but your brain might be pretty active. Um, so within this, these two things generally uh, make up different sleep cycles. Okay. So generally, again, ish, uh, sleep cycle is going to be 90 minutes ish long. Okay. So. Um, depending on how much sleep you have or lack thereof, can impact, you know, maybe one thing about it. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> this goes a lot deeper, right? We're not too, I'm not too, too concerned with this, but, um, like I said, we want to get some other <coughs> stuff. But, this is important. Both stages are important. I wouldn't say there's one that's more important than the other. Um, just know that they both happen, and a lack of sleep might, if you cut sleep off early, you might impact a little bit of this. Okay, so, um, yeah, so, <clears throat> now, so we think of lack of sleep, and it's been done on like general health measures, right? And so we're going to get into a lot of things that probably maybe affect us directly, but also maybe affect people that we're really close to, right? Our parents, our grandparents, uh, you know, our parents' friends, whatever it is, right? And stuff that we're going to have to consider when we uh, start to get older. Um, also, if you're planning on coaching at any point, and you know, you're going to be in the point where there's going to be sleepless nights, right? Uh, watching film, breaking down film, making sure the guys are, and girls are prepared for the next day, it comes at a cost, right? I'll say it's bad, but we gotta know the, what's going on with us at least, right? So we gotta ask ourselves, is it gonna be worth it? Um, and uh, you know, the sleep that we are getting, can we make it efficient, right? So within these couple, um, within these couple uh, slides, again, we got some crazy stats, and we're not going through every single one directly, in, uh, but we'll expand on these a little bit. Okay, so, one thing with like blood glucose, and typically like people who have been shown to have lack of sleep are going to be probably more prone to being like type 2 diabetics, right? Um, type 2 diabetes is something that plagues us uh, as the United States and as people in the world, and it can cost a lot of money over time, right? So there's some cool stuff that looked at um, people who were like six days of four hours or less of sleep. Um, basically, they were like 40% less effective at and less effective at um, absorbing blood sugar. So what's happening? Right, so if we're not effective at, effective at absorbing blood sugar and basically controlling blood sugar, um, again, that's kind of what's going on when people become type 2 diabetics. Short story, right? Um, we also look at like cells being less receptive of, of insulin over seven days of people who lack sleep. So again, what's that mean? Essentially, like we're gonna essentially need probably more insulin to do its job. That's type 2 diabetes. 
right? Type 2 diabetes is that you are basically not reactive or um, your cells aren't really all as responsive to insulin as they once were, so we need more of it, right? So where does that more come from? We've got to inject ourselves, right? So people are type 2 diabetic, that's kind of what's going on, okay? So um, some stuff there. Fertility, this is big time for guys and girls, right? So sperm count and just overall like sperm health goes down with lack of sleep. Um, there's also in the girls, like per, there's a decent percent drop in the like follicular releasing hormone in women, which is basically responsible for women being like fertile. Okay, so um, also a crazy thing too is that this is having less than eight hours of sleep uh, during pregnancy is like a risk factor for having a miscarriage in the first like trimester <coughs> of pregnancy, right? Um, so it's pretty big time. Right, and going on to the next one, looking at hormones, and this kind of ties into fertility a little bit, is that like testosterone, we think of testosterone, at least for the guys, like being good, that's the juice we got. Gives us a little energy, we feel good, we feel like we're ready to go, things like that, goes down as well. Okay, so, um, so we got like less testosterone, our overall sperm count is down, and so like our ability to basically recreate, uh, <coughs> especially if our partner is lacking a little bit of sleep, again, we might be kind of butt heads a little bit. Okay, so I think that's super important because essentially probably at least a handful of us are at least planning on having kids at some point, right? So making sure that you and your partner are on um, squared away before actually um, deciding to make that decision. Uh, measure their genes too, so um, that's a big thing. Uh, Hormone-wise, growth hormone uh, can be impacted. Cortisol as well. So we think cortisol typically being like a stress hormone, a uh, big driver of inflammation, right? Um, and also like sympathetic related, so if you hear like sympathetic nervous system, we'll talk about this more later, we'll talk a little bit in class today, uh, is that it's go, go, go. You guys trying to learn anatomy, sympathetic nervous system is like fight or flight, right? So when there's a lot of cortisol present, typically that is one thing that's kind of going on within our body, which again, sleep can, can impact that, and uh, we'll talk about how to maybe deal with that a little bit later and kind of what's going on. <coughs> Okay, uh, dementia and Alzheimer's, again, I'm sure at least one of us in here has some family member that has been suffering with this and is super scared, right? One of the weirdest things is that when you go and see your grandparents at the nursing home and they don't remember where your name is. That's ever happened to you, it's like a pinch in the heart, okay? Um, so again, within like, as we're sleeping, we got this like process and we can almost think about our brain being clean, right? It's like a sanitation uh, that's going on within our brain and so what happens is that there's these thing they're called amyloid proteins that get built up um, and then they get flushed out when we sleep. So if they don't get flushed or if we don't sleep as much, then they're not gonna get flushed, flushed out as much. And so that amyloid protein is something that has been shown to be related to or people have a high buildup of this when they have dementia and Alzheimer's. Right? So again it kind of hand in hand makes sense, right? If we don't get a lot of cleaning going on within here, then again we're gonna have some sort of buildup and what happens with that? Possibly some of that right there. Um, cancer, again, there's these things in our bodies called killer cells. Basically, those are less active when uh, we lack sleep. Those basically attack cancer cells and try to take care of them before they grow into anything serious. Right? All of us probably have some microscopic forms of cancer growing in our bodies right now. Okay? Sounds scary. Now. But, it's probably what's going on. Okay? But, so, again, we want to try to be, um, have those on uh, all levels. This is a fun one. Next one, immune system. Here we go. Uh, so again, now's the time everyone gets sick, right? Finals time, or not finals, sorry, midterm, uh, craving for tests, staying up all night, doing this, doing that. Um, everyone's sick, right? Well, you don't get any more sick, or right? anything serious later on. But, um, so there's some, there's some cool stuff that looked at. Uh, basically, the scientists like injected the flu into these people and then had them sleep five hours, six hours, uh, seven hours, and then over the course of time, they measured how much, how much snot they had. So, okay, kind of a weird study, I know, but basically showing like, hey, the people who had less sleep had more snot buildup and were less uh, able to fight off the flu. There's also flu shots as well. Flu shots are kind of controversial. Uh, whether you believe in flu shots or not, I don't know. Uh, I'm not gonna be the one that tells you uh, here or there, but um, over like seven days of uh, lack of sleep, it was the same thing, five hours, six hours, seven hours. Um, where the flu shot was like 50% less responsive to fighting off the flu. So like if you have really crappy sleep for a week and you decide, oh well, my mom told me or Gabby told me to go get the flu shot, like how much, you know, how much good is it gonna be doing? It might do something, right? Four hours. That's the only thing on the flu shot. 
Um, and then cardiovascular stuff, right? Blood pressure, heart rate, sympathetic response. Basically, your arteries lose integrity over time because that's something else that happens as we're sleeping is that we kind of get that restorative uh, process from that. Okay, so a handful of different things. If your heart rate's going to be higher, blood, pre blood pressure's going to be higher, things are just going to feel harder. You think about going to the football field, going to the basketball court, uh, going wherever you're going to go, and things just feel hard. Again, there's going to be strain on your body from that. Right? You have to work harder to be able to maintain whatever level that you're going to be at. Um, and so maybe it wouldn't be so hard, right? Um, so a couple things there. And then this will be the last one within the general health stuff. So again, a lot of us are going to be working with people or ourselves are trying to build up some muscle mass or maybe lose a little weight or whatever it is, right? We're telling our kids, our clients, our athletes, whoever we're working with, that, you know, give them some suggestions on what they can do. Again, this is a cool thing that looked at, um, basically there was a group that had 14 days in a uh, caloric deficit and they kind of found people who had four, or sorry, yeah, people who had four or less hours of sleep within those 14 days, <coughs> basically whatever weight that they lost, 70% of it was from muscle versus fat. Our bodies are freaky, like weird, where we want to try to hold on to uh, fat as much as we can, and so we're going to try to get rid of whatever we can to keep us, you know, afloat basically. That's pretty, that comes into play. If you guys are dealing with like weight loss client, clients or athletes or yourself, you're trying, trying to lose a little weight, feel pretty good. Again, you might, <laughs> you might be on a lower calorie diet, but like how much muscle are you losing? Right, some of that stuff can be supplemented with exercise and amount of protein and stuff like that, but for, uh, you know, just something to consider there. And this is a fun one too, right? So weight gain as well, because we all have to deal with it, right? We're gonna be times, there's gonna be times where we're stressed, there's going to be times where we eat, there's going to be times where our kids, our clients, or whatever we're working with, there's going to be times where they gain a little weight. It's okay, it's going to happen. Probably. Okay, but the thing that, again, kind of go back to the hormones, is that sleep can impact leptin, which is basically tells your body to feel full, and ghrelin, which tells your body that you're hungry. Right, so these things kind of get thrown out of whack, and then you're going to be more prone to overeating um, and going through it. So if you ever wake up, so this is something to like, keep note of as you guys are going through the semester and uh, just going through your lives, is that pay attention to like what your food choices are and what you want to eat when you only have a couple hours of sleep. Typically it's not very good. Wake up early, have to go to the airport, you want to consume some good stuff, good stuff, fun stuff, right? Um, there was something too, study-wise, they basically locked these people in a room and they were like, hey, you're going to sleep um, as much as you want or you're going to sleep only four hours. And so the group that only slept four hours, they had, so they woke up and all of a sudden they just had a huge buffet of food. It sounds decent, right? So a huge buffet of food, and they also had a side table that had a bunch of snacks on it. So cookies, chips, candy, soda, stuff like that. And so the people who slept less were more likely to grab and consume from this, uh, you know, kind of fun table uh, versus the other group. Right, and so what they kind of found is that those people ate like over 300 more calories during that sitting. And so now 300 calories is no big deal. But like, that over time ends up being a lot. Over the course of a week, over the course of a year, over the course of 10 years, where are you gonna be at? Probably a lot, right? So, um, I'll be packing on some poundage uh, to do that, so, which obviously we're trying to stay away from. All right, so now looking at like recovery and performance, right? For us, there's a constant tug of war. And, you know, so hey, we want to perform at a high level, but we also want to be able to recover so we can perform at a high level, right? And so this is kind of the battle that we're going to be going through and some things that we're going to kind of, um, you know, look at a little bit uh, right here. Because all of us, you know, I, I'm sure are in, uh, interested in athletics in some capacity or involved in athletics or whatever. So, again, it's going to be pretty important <coughs> uh, for this. So, Okay, so three factors we're looking at, like basically sleeping for recovery and just sleeping in general, right? We're looking at sleep duration, so how long, um, your sleep quality, so how well did you sleep? And there's not really like a real, super, super good definition of sleep quality, and there's some obvious ones that kind of make sense just by looking at it, but basically it's just kind of described as like, hey, what's your personal satisfaction with how you slept? Pretty simple, right? You wake up, do you feel good? Do you feel refreshed? Do you feel like you're ready to go for the day? Or do you feel like crap? Right, and so, and then also uh, time. Uh, <coughs> sorry, phase. Looking at timing of sleep and like your circadian rhythm, basically being on a normal schedule uh, with how the sun comes up and when the sun goes down and stuff like that. So these three things are going to be impactful on our our ability to recover. So again, like this week, 
maybe not much now, but at the beginning of the week, at least we're probably planning, hey, we're going to stay up all night, we're going to wake up and we're going to sleep a couple hours, wake up, take this test, and then go back to sleep. Right? That's going to mess, you know, that's going to mess up the last one for sure. Um, obviously, it's going to mess with duration. It's probably going to mess with quality as well. Right? So again, if you're coming out a hard training session or you're coming out of practice or whatever it is, like, we kind of need to make sure that these three things are uh, locked and loaded, but, which, like I said, we'll talk about some things that we can do for that uh, here a little bit. Okay, fun one, here we go. So hopefully that's not a bust. Right? All of us care about sport, all of us care about performance, or hopefully this isn't one of our athletes. But chances are it's gonna be at some point. Right? It sucks. Knee injuries, injuries in general are terrible. Right? They're no fun. Because it makes you sad, you're away from the team. Um, not a good place to be in. But like I said, it's gonna happen. Okay, but so for a lot of us who are gonna be in coaching, we're gonna be working with younger athletes and stuff like that. So again, there was something that found like when you're sleeping less than eight hours that you're 1.7 times more likely to get injured. In this case, they looked at middle school and high school kids. Um, but again, it's, you could probably carry over at least, uh, it would at least be probably comparable to college athletes and stuff like that. Our lot of gonna work in the high school level. Okay, so that's a big one. You tell, you tell your high school kid, like, hey, you wanna be hurt? Obviously no, right? So again, and we can give them some ideas of how we can impact their sleep, which hopefully they don't fall in that category. Also, too, as coaches, right? Again, we're going to be coaches. Um, I'm probably in some capacity, or we're going to be working with people in some capacity, right? Um, so one thing that we do have to pay attention to is going to be um, increased training load, and decreased sleep. Right? So there's going to be times at practice where you're going to say, like, hey, we need to go, go, go. We, today we're going to go hard. Today we're gonna to go hard, today we're gonna to go hard. But then you find that you had this big spike in training and you had this drop off in sleep. So again, we kind of have to be balanced a little bit with that, at least be aware of it. Again, there's gonna be times we need to go hard, we need to push, right? It's how we get in shape, it's how we get better, it's how we win. But again, we kind of have to ask ourselves like, when and where, and when's the right place to do that. There's ways to track that, which I'll show you guys in a sec. A little bit later. Um, there's things to be aware of for that. Okay. Also, back to the flu study. We need to be able to play. Okay. So again, if we're going to be in a position where our immune systems suppressed, they're going to be a little bit lower. We're probably going to be more likely to catch the flu. If we catch the flu, we're not going to play. If we don't play, we're not going to win. If we don't win, we're not going to sell tickets. If we don't sell tickets, and so on and so forth. You can go. Right. So health is going to drive the performance. Make sure health is taken care of so we can make sure performance is way up here. Okay, that's what we're after, that's what we're about. We're in the business of that, right? So we'll come back to this here in a sec uh, and when we talk about some ways to track and some things that we can do to look at. A couple things. Now, performance gains or loss, right? So um, we look at strength. There's some stuff that looks at like three days of sleep restriction, which is basically just limiting the amount of sleep that they get for three days. Showed like decreased uh, overall uh, weights and squat bench and deadlifting. Um, there's some, some stuff that out there that said, ah, one night probably didn't make that much of a deal, or that big of a difference, right? So again, take that for what you will. Um, there's also some things that look at two hours of sleep extension, so getting two hours longer of sleep. Um, can actually, like over the course of time, can actually increase your sprint time. So, in that study, they, it was with uh, basketball players, and it was a small group, right? It was, you know, it wasn't 50 some people that did it. But, at least some decent uh, data, some stuff that's out there. And then just overall power output, a little bit less clear. So the anaerobic stuff is a little more tricky um, to kind of figure out and kind of see what's going on when we lack sleep. Um, but, sleep extension, sleeping longer in general, can give us a, again, a decent boost in uh, some things there. So now we look at the aerobic side of things. Um, again, for this, like your time to exhaustion gets worse, right? So basically, when you start getting tired, it comes earlier when you still sleep as much. That goes back to what we talked about already, right? Things just feel hard. Your heart rate's going to be higher. Your blood pressure's going to be higher. Your overall like rating of perceived exertion is going to be higher. Okay, so. Also, decreased distance covered. So looking at, I think they looked at like a 3K and how much, or sorry, they looked at a certain amount of time and how much distance they were able to cover when it came to uh, running. Um, again, that was worse. And overall, just time trial. So again, in that case, they ran a 3K, figured out what their time trial, or figured out what they were, 
And again, people who were generally less than like six hours had worse time. Okay, so impacts everything. Performance, cool stuff here. So for some of us who might or might be involved in tennis or are interested in tennis, um, they looked at accuracy. So now we kind of look at like movement skill and movement performance, right? So tennis accuracy, there's some cool stuff that I looked at like basically five hours of sleep versus um, people who are not too precise. So one of them had a five hours of sleep that had their tennis accuracy serve, that had their accuracy of their tennis serve drop by basically cut in half. Um, and then there's another group that had their sleep extension by about an hour and a half. So again, they're able to sleep and lay in bed longer, essentially. Um, and in this case, it looked at dart throwing. So if you guys go to, uh, you're out and about on the weekend, you want to win some money playing some darts, make sure your sleep is up there. Okay, so. Um, <clears throat> and then like three point and free throw increase as well. Right, so again, this was going back to the study you referenced earlier, where free throw and three point percentage went up like 10%-ish, um, you know, after having, you know, five to seven weeks of sleep extension. So basically, strategy on how to sleep longer, for the most part. Okay, so, some pretty cool stuff, pretty important stuff, um, as we kind of roll through this, right? It impacts everything, as we kind of just found, right? So, um, Regardless of what sport that we play or what sport we're going to coach, you know, there's a, probably a pretty decent chance that there's going to be something that involves accuracy, there's going to be something that involves coordination, there's going to be something that involves aerobic capacity, something that involves strength, speed, and power. Right? So, um, for a lot of sports, it's going to be a combination of five of them, right? Um, here's a fun one. This is a goofy one, I just kind of throw it in here. Okay, so this one they looked at. Uh, basically late night tweeting of NBA players and people who, the NBA guys had like 100 and some uh, NBA guys and they, it's like the guys who tweeted after 11 p.m. so kind of suggesting that they had, uh, didn't sleep as well, again it's a kind of stretch, I know. But basically in that case their um, shooting percentage was down <coughs> and uh, overall point scored was down. So, interesting weird stuff. So. For your fingers, turn to your fingers. Okay, so. All right, cognitive impact as well. Okay, so um, we look at us like sport relies on the ability to react and make decisions. That's what we do, right? We have to be able to react, we have to be able to make a decision and go, right? So whether that's chasing down the ball, whether that's reacting to our opponent that's going to make a move on us, whatever it is, we have to be able to react to that and decide where we're going to go and what our next step is from there, right? Um, so again, that, some of that stuff's gonna go down from there. Also, all of us have probably had that point in our life where we maybe had a rough night the night before, uh, maybe we didn't sleep all that well, and woke up, maybe our mom was bugging us, maybe our girlfriend, boyfriend was bugging us, whatever, and we just, we just snapped. Got pissed off a little bit. Happens sometimes, then they yell at you, right? So um, again, for us, like when we're on like low levels of sleep, pretty much like our emotional reactivity gets impacted. Our overall mood gets impacted, and like our decision making gets impacted. Go up again, same thing, go back to the food stuff. Right? So we're more likely to make poor decisions uh, when our sleep's at a lower level. Okay, so skill acquisition work, like so learning while sleeping, like what the heck is that? Okay, so the, there was something that looked at people playing the piano left-handed and trying to uh, basically try to see how accurate they were <clears throat> um, either with 12 hours just in between time or 12 hours in between time with sleep and again, people who had some sleep were uh, a little more accurate on being able to recite some of the stuff going on. Right, so um, next one, late practices, early practices. A lot of times when we're running camps, when we're running, working with athletes, when we gotta have you know, late practices and we wake up and we need to go, six o'clock in the morning, there might be times where like, again, sleep we talk about being able to pretty much learn things and kind of uh, make sure our memories and our skill acquisition and all that gets kind of squared away and uh, structured well while we're sleeping. So like, if we have practice till 9 p.m. and then we make everyone wake up at 6 a.m., like how much of that are they gonna remember the next day? Probably some of it, hopefully. But like if they walk up and they walk in all groggy and feeling all weird, again, how much are they gonna be able to retain and how much are they gonna be able to reply? Or unplot, sorry. Um, and then that goes along with strategy and tactics, right? 
I'll hopefully, you know, obviously the physicality of the game comes into play. Basketball, football, uh, soccer, any sport you can think of pretty much. There's also strategy. There's also tactics, right? So like our ability to learn those things gets messed up if we're not, uh, again, putting a high priority on some of the uh, sleep stuff, right? So what's that mean for film study? Okay, coaches, as us, we're expecting our kids to watch film, we're expecting them to do this and expecting them to do that. But like, are they really set up to be able to learn well, right? So, memory consolidation, ability to recall, um, make decisions, focus, reaction time. All that stuff's gonna be down. So if you have someone come in and they've slept three hours, like, film study's not gonna be that great. They're not gonna be able to pay attention, they're not gonna be able to recall what they just learned, and then it's just gonna be a dumpster fire probably, more times than not. Right? We've probably all been there at some point, ourselves as athletes. So, um, as coaches, those are some things we have to be aware of. It's like, how much are we throwing at them? Right? How much are we truly expecting them to remember? So, um, I think that plays a huge, huge, huge role in all of this. Right? We gotta learn, we gotta be good at our sport. Right? We have to have good strategy, we have to have good tactics. But, yeah, are we kind of limited? We might be game ourselves. <laughs> For us, sleeping just push, push the save button. Right, so everything we learned from the night before, or from the day before, again, from sleeping, it kind of gets all that thing, or gets all those uh, things that we just learned a little bit more clear. Um, and like I said, how can we uh, apply that when we get out there? Push the save button with a lot of sleep, and you're going to be uh, just fine. That's what we want. That's what we're at. Now right, here we go. Good part now. Okay, so there's all the all the stats, all the crazy stuff we can impact. Now we'll get to the practicality of it. So, um, all of us probably have some sort of something going on with our sleep, right? Good, bad, indifferent, I don't know. But I'd be very, very amazed if there was someone who just absolutely had zero problems ever in the whole entire life with sleeping better. You also awesome. keep it rolling. A lot of times that happens. It doesn't happen. Okay, so um, how do we get better? That's where we're gonna get after. Okay, so now, so we look at like what's the limiting factor? What's the limiting factor for kids? Right? School timing. We're gonna talk about that later. Screen time, video games, parents being annoying, annoying parents. So go back to middle school. Go back to high school. Your mom came knocking. Mom or dad came knocking on the door. How annoying was that? It's terrible. Suck. Go somewhere, I don't want to deal with you right now. Right? That's what we think about. We don't want to be up. Okay? So, um, college athletes, what's the limiting factor? Studying, time management, late games, late practices, anxiety before the games, right? Um, travel schedule, screens, video games, right? Uh, caffeine timing as well. Okay? Adults, what's the limiting factor? Newborns, yikes. Kids in general, stress. Significant others, caffeine timing, screens, older adults, weak bladders, circadian timing, caffeine, and then just basically inability to sleep either. <coughs> so, as you can see, there's a little trend there. Screens come up on every single one of those. Okay, we're gonna get into that and some uh, crazy stuff that's out there. Um, but yeah, so we'll get into some tips and things like that. Again, a lot of us are probably gonna be within these top three uh, for the most part um, because we're going to have kids at some point. A lot of us right now are college athletes and we're all technical adults. Right, so um, keep that stuff in mind for sure. So parents being annoying thing. We'll, uh, we'll touch on All right, sleep hygiene. So if you have a stack of sleep hygiene papers, uh, go ahead and take one and pass them around. So. Uh, you can need a pen or pencil. Um, if you have a, or, I think I'm, I think I'm printing out like 70 or something. It might, I'll pull it up on the screen um, as well if we just have a scratch sheet of paper. We're gonna see where we're at. Okay, so grab one, pass it back. I'll let you guys know what we got going on. Um, and so we have a handful that are coming around now. Some of you guys have seen this before, some of you guys have done this before, so uh, if you have, then maybe we'll pass it to maybe someone who has it, but. I'll pull it up right here too. Don't start filling it out yet. I'll, I'll let you guys know what's up. Okay. Are you about to get it?
All right, so as we're passing that out, who wants to take a stab at sleep hygiene? What's it mean? And I'll give you a hint. It's not how dirty your bed is. No, you don't tell me. Not how dirty your sheets are either. Okay, uh, we're close. So we said how well we sleep. Not so much. Any other guesses out there? What's sleep hygiene? Any thoughts? No. Could you be it? What do you say? That can play into it a little bit. Okay, keep going. What else? Go. Yeah. It's all good. Get close. There we go. So sleep hygiene. There's a couple different definitions, but think about this as being like your habits preparing for sleep. What are you doing before bed? Preparing yourself for sleep. Now, on your guys' sheet, or if you have a stretch sheet of paper, if you can write it up here, it's no big deal. Okay, so what we're gonna do is that this is a sleep hygiene questionnaire. Okay, so what we're gonna do here is that we're gonna assess what your guys' sleep hygiene is and see how good it is or maybe how bad. Okay, so what I want you to want you, what I want you to do is be as honest as possible filling out this sheet. I'm not gonna collect them, I'm not gonna look at them. It's for you just to be more aware of what your habits are. Because a lot of times we're not aware of them until we actually see something in front of us. Okay, so go ahead and take a couple minutes and um, let's go ahead and fill this out and kind of see where we're at and then we'll talk about some of some of these um, and then like we'll get into things that we can do. Five more, right? 
Now, so, if you look at this sheet, so again, just figure out, obviously figure out where you're, at, where you're at, but look at the sheet and like, just look at it and see like, well, what are some easy wins? Right, what are some things that I can do like tonight or things that I can do, you know, on a regular basis that is gonna just bring maybe this down to one point out. Again, we gotta take baby steps. We're looking for easy wins for this type of stuff. If you're not gonna go through and be like, all right, change this, change this, change this, change this, change this, it's not gonna happen. And if it does happen, it's not gonna happen for long. Right? We know zero to hundred doesn't work. Right? So gradual, right? That's what we gotta think about. Okay? So hold on to the sheet. Uh, we're going to talk about some other things that we can do as well. So, um, we'll get into pretty much all of these. So. so, look at where you're at, what did you score high at, and what can we do to impact that? Hopefully some of the stuff we're going to talk about today will be able to help with that. Okay, so, kind of keep that off to the side. And, like, the stuff that we talk about will uh, hopefully assist you, and hopefully you can be a little better sleep. Okay, now, here's some general sleep hygiene strategies. Um, now. Okay, some general-ish sleep hygiene strategies. We're not going to go through every single one of these. Okay, some of these might be a little uh, back and forth and it might not be, might be some stuff you might not be able to do. So Alright, so, um, regular schedule. Alright, now, so if you look at kind of where, let's look at number two, where that first arrow is, and then the one where the other arrow is, okay? The first one, if you cannot sleep within 15 minutes, get out of bed, try performing a mundane task. Now, I'm sure all of us at some point have had some issues going to bed. Fair? At least at one, a couple points in our life, right? So what's going to be suggested is that you get up and do something that is pretty much mindless. You get up, uh, you go into the living room, you go outside of your bedroom and just perform something. Again, it might be some stretching, might be some breathing. I've heard of people going and like sweeping and just doing stuff they don't really, again, it's easy, don't really require much big brain power uh, for that. And then going back into their room when they feel tired and then trying to go back to sleep. Okay, we'll talk about why here in a sec. The next arrow, avoid watching TV, eating, working, or reading in the bed. I understand that some of us might live in the dorms and that might be our workplace. Right, which is an ideal opposite, but it's our situation. Okay, but once we get our own room, once we get our own stuff, again, we want to try to keep our bedroom pretty much just for sleeping, right? Now, our brain is really, really good with association. So if we spend a lot of time in bed, tossing, turning, trying to go to sleep when we can't, or we spend a lot of time in bed working, checking emails, watching TV, <coughs> stuff like that, then our brain's gonna associate that space with a space where you don't fall asleep. Does that make sense? Okay, so what is kind of suggested is that, like, hey, just do things outside of the bedroom that are gonna get you very, very tired, and once you're to the point where you're almost knocking out, go into bed and fall asleep. Just so we don't have that weird association uh, going on for that. Um, let's see. Nap, we'll talk about that. Fluid intake, we'll talk about that. Room temp, we'll talk about that. All right, so we'll get on to the next couple. Now, going back to electronics and our phone. This is what we commonly see. This is very, very anxiety-inducing. A lot of us sleep with this next to our head or in, uh, next to our bed. What happens when we hit the unlock screen? Go through here, put the code in, whatever, and we have access to basically the world. We have access to everything. We see this little thing and there's a hundred of them because we never check it. We see all these text messages because we never check it, or we just have a bunch from overnight. We have all these notifications on Instagram, we have all these notifications on Facebook, yada, 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 and we have all this impulse to try to see what those are. So this being the first thing that you do when you wake up, especially if it's right next to your bed, is probably the worst thing to do. Why? Because of what we just talked about. Associating your space of sleep with work, or with stress, or anxiety. So. Go to sleep with your phone somewhere else or further away from your body if you, if you need the alarm, okay? Because we unlock the whole world when we do this and at that time, it's 7 a.m., 8 a.m., whatever, it's after a bad night of sleep, it's gonna be a rough day for you. We've all had this happen, I'm sure, right? So take a little time, wake up, you know, get a glass of water and kind of hang out, chill for a sec before you actually go on your phone. I'll help you out, probably do some. Okay, some little sleep hacks now. Okay, some little things that we can do, and this will help you guys out a ton. 
Okay, so allowing sleep opportunity for at least eight hours. And this goes back to the time management stuff. If you don't allow yourself for eight hours, how are you gonna get eight hours? So if you go to bed at one o'clock in the morning and you know you have to be up at six, it's not eight hours, right? So um, at least allow yourself the time to have eight hours. And if you don't get it, again, you don't get it. But at least you gave yourself the opportunity to have eight hours. Does that make sense? Um, exercise, but not, not real late. Again, body temperature might be pretty high. It might be tough to get it down. Um, this next one. Um, we're gonna come, uh, we'll talk about it now and then we'll come back to it and do a little thing. Talk it out, write it out, get help. Right, we all have anxieties that we deal with every single day, things that we're worried about, uh, whether it be with our family, whether it be with school, whether it be with practice, whether it be with coach, whether it be with whatever, don't worry about it. There's a lot of things that go on in here. And a lot of times, this stuff gets unraveled when we're trying to go to bed at least. It's the end of the day. Right, so, write it out, go get help. Right? If, you, if you snore a lot, go get help. If you can't go to bed because you have insomnia, go get help. It's gonna, the things that you do now are gonna impact you what you do or when you're 60, 70, 80 years old, if you make it that far, okay? Um, wake up natural light, weighted blanket. Do you guys have a weighted blanket? Any hands? Weighted blanket, anybody? You like it or no? Yeah. Pretty decent. Dean, you got one? Yeah. You like it? Weighted hey, blanket's pretty decent, right? Put the weight on it, it can help you relax a little bit. Um, pretty good there. Fiction reading, this is actually pretty good. Um, for, if you guys aren't big readers, fine. But like, the, probably the worst thing to do is like read research right before bed or read like uh, things that, like professional development stuff, it's terrible. So if you think about getting better, you don't want to fall asleep after that. So read something you don't really care about that much, right? So if it's uh, fiction type stuff, stories, go for it, right, fine. Um, warm bath or shower, you get in there, you're hot, you walk out, you're cold, your body temperature's gonna fall. Uh, we'll talk about this in a sec. And now, here's some different things you can do for consumption. Now, what I will say is that these things are probably, um, at least some like supplement-wise, are probably like your last-ditch efforts because we gotta take care of a lot of other things first, and these just might be the cherry on top, okay? Tart cherry on top, okay? So, some things that we can do, right? Melatonin, generally through jet lag, insomnia, travel, stuff like that. Um, now, this is a big one, I'd probably start this one, write this down, keep it locked in the memory bank forever, is that progressively decreasing your uh, in walk, like water intake throughout the day. This is gonna depend on practice, and depend on all that. But like all of us probably wake up in the middle of the night and we have to pee, right? And that just comes from sleep. So if we can progress, if we maybe start off in the morning instead of, again, going on our phone and doing this, maybe chug a couple glasses of water and that's gonna set us up good for the day. And then when it comes to be eight, nine o'clock, then we don't have to really Drink as much, right? Therefore, we're not gonna be peeing as much, right? So, uh, lavender oils, there's some cool stuff out there that looks at that. There's magnesium supplements, CBD. Uh, CBD is gonna be pretty decent, probably more so for anxiety than actual sleep quality. This is kinda, I don't think there's enough yet on this, but it helps anxiety, it's probably gonna help you sleep. Okay, so, uh, tart cherry juice, that's pretty decent. Um, and then just limiting large meals. Probably the worst thing to do is like, if you had a huge meal right before bed, what happens to your body temperature if you have a huge meal? Goes up. We have to digest all this stuff. What happens to our body temperature as we sleep? It's supposed to go down. We don't need that. Okay, so you're kind of can't be counteracted kind of a little bit. Okay, so a couple things there. Now we talked about being more sympathetic, um, and that being one of the drivers of us being like, okay, fight or flight, go 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 go. We can't fall asleep. Cortisol through the roof. So. Some of you guys have done this with, but we want to think about getting ourselves into a parasympathetic. Parasympathetic rest and digest. Right? So before bed, doing some like decompression things, some breathing, we're gonna do a little thing here in a sec. Um, stuff like this is gonna help you bring you down some. Right? I know like basketball, those guys like will do some stuff after squatting and after some of the lifts, and uh, that might look related to this. And then usually they're just like, chill. Oof. Right? Calm, relax. Okay, that's kind of what we want sometimes. Especially before bed, if we can do this, it takes five minutes. Okay, so, so some things that we can do, anything that's decompression related, um, rounded back breathing and breathing through your belly is gonna be important, right? You should be yawning before bed. This will get you there. I'm gonna see if we can get us there right now. Okay, so, some different things there. Um, these are all money in the bank. You have like a, even like a back extension machine type deal, um, or like a immersion table. Hitting that before bed, feeling pretty good. Okay, now, so here's what we're gonna do to try to, breathing wise, to try to drive this, parasympathetic. Okay, so, 
Uh, let's see here. So here's what we need to do. If you guys ever heard of box breathing, this kind of helps relax a little bit. This kind of helps calm a little bit of anxiety. It kind of helps you focus as well. So the objective of this is that we're going to think about, we take a big breath in, four seconds, hold, four seconds, breathe out, four seconds. Uh, basically, hang out four seconds again, and then we keep rolling through that. Okay, so in practice, what it's going to look like is going to be here. Okay, so big breath in. One, two, three, four. Hold. Exhale. Hold. Okay, so we're going to do it now. Okay, ready? So I'll walk you guys through it. What I want you guys to do, um, I don't care. If you're in a comfortable position, you can put your head. Go ahead and put your head on the table if you want. Or go like this. Just close your eyes and lay back. <laughs> Or not, whatever. In your arms, wherever you want to do it. So. Okay? You can leave them up wherever you want to Okay, <laughs> now, so try to take this seriously. Okay, we want to think about breathing through our stomach. Okay, breathing through our stomach. Okay, so I'm going to walk you guys through this. We're going to do a couple rounds through, and we should feel pretty relaxed and uh, calm in the head. Okay? So, I'll walk you guys through. So, what we're going to do, we're going to breathe deep in for four seconds. Ready? Inhale. One, two, Three, four, hold. One, two, three, four. Exhale. One, two, three, four. Hold. Two, three, four. Inhale. Four seconds. Two, three, four. Hold. Two, three, four. Exhale. Two, three, four. Hold. We'll go three more on you guys at your own pace. And hold them for four. And walk them through that a little bit. Big breath through your belly. Think about relaxing. Finish up whatever cycle that you're on. So finish up whatever cycle you're on. You can raise your head up slow. Don't get head rotating. How do you feel? Feel weird, right? Okay, so if you do it decently, and you should feel a little, a little tired. It's okay. We're not here for long. Okay, so. Um, now, that's something that we can do, right? Deep belly breathing, again, we think about that as a pretty good anxiety uh, reducing strategy, something that we can do before bed. So if we pair that up with some of this stuff, we're gonna be in probably pretty good shape, right? Relax, chill out, all right? So, we've got some yawns, it's perfect, it's what we want. Okay, so. <coughs> This will help you out a ton. Help your clients out a ton, help your athletes out a ton, because anxiety is through the roof right now. It's gonna keep on climbing, okay? So we have to at least have something to deal with. Okay, these are some uh, meditation apps that you can use. Um, again, to try to help with some anxiety and help with some psychological stuff that's going on. These are all pretty solid. Again, you can write these down if you want, if you want to download them, whatever. Um, personally, one that I use is Simple Habit. This one's pretty good. Um, I like this one a lot because, and pretty much all of them, they have meditations for everything. Go, go into work. In the car ride, before bed, reducing anxiety, yada yada yada. There's every I saw one there for some people who are pregnant. Right? It's stuff for everything. So these are all some examples of some things that we can do to help get us in a good, like relaxed state before actually going to bed. One thing to kind of keep in mind is that me mental disorders and sleep disorders typically go hand in hand. Right? I think a lot of times in the past it was like, alright, well, a symptom of you know, depression, a symptom of anxiety, a symptom of this and that, is lack of sleep or poor sleep. But what if it's the other way around? Right? What if the poor sleep caused that to be worse? Right? So typically those two things, like I say, go hand in hand, because if you're super, super anxious, you're not gonna fall asleep. It's not gonna happen. Right? So <clears throat> you know, working on both of these things is probably gonna have a pretty good impact on it for sure. Okay? Okay. Um, two-way street. For sure. So, 
So there's some different ways to track. We're looking at sleep, right? So there's different devices that are out there. Just a good old-fashioned notebook. Just pay attention to what you did the night before and how you think, and how you felt when you wake up. It can be pretty valuable, I think. Um, there's also two for like you guys who are going to be coaches, and you guys are doing this is something that we do with sport performance. Is that looking at the player's sleep, and then being able to give like a coach's graph of what their averages are <coughs> over time, right? So you can do this in. Uh, through Google survey, send out a survey, get the results, and then, again, just pretty simple stuff that you can do. I can walk through it, I don't think it will So this is something we can do. We go back to load management and looking at, hey, when can we increase uh, workload? Or If we go through and we find all of our players, they all slept five hours last night for who knows what reason, today's probably not the best, the best time to go, 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 right? Something might happen. Right, so, or if they all slept four hours and hey, we're gonna have a really intense film session, how much are they gonna remember? Right, so if we can track this stuff, this is this costs zero dollars. Okay, send out a survey, figure it out, see what they all have, and then you're gonna go from there. Okay, it's pretty easy uh, for that. Afford that. All right, so the last like five or six minutes, and then uh, I'll let you guys like come up and ask some questions, and then we can talk about some of So some other things to talk about or think about at least. Okay, so. Um, I think one thing for us is that like the development of ourselves, but obviously the, the development of like kids is pretty important, right? There's kids basically need minimal screen time. There's like suggestions that are out there that say like if you're 18 months or less, you should have zero screen time unless it's communicating with your parents and their, their parents in some way. How many of us know 18 months? Sorry, people, kids who are a year and a half who are on the iPad a lot. Any of us? Probably a handful. That's not good. Okay, so now we look at like teenagers, uh, teenagers who had an hour of screen time and two hours of screen time before bed, 23 and 38% uh, less melatonin. We talked about melatonin in this role already. Right, so if, that, if melatonin is going to be limited, then your ability to fall, or your ability to be tired is probably going to be limited. Um, and that's big time for sure, right? Looking at also screen time in parents impacts the kids. So if you're a parent or you're going to be a parent, um, the amount of time that you spend on your phone shows behavior, right? There's something I saw that like parents who have 10 hours of screen time, it might be likely that their kids have five hours of screen time. Like weird stuff like that. So parents who are on their phones more, again, typically their kids um, have a higher chance of disrupting, whining, crying, doing stuff like that. There's a term that's called technoference, basically. Like, Technology is getting in the way. Um, and then this one too. So screen time, two hours or uh, ish uh, in the day for kids who are less than five years old, why it matters. So basically, brain development gets blunted and impacted. That's huge. Your white matter, your brain assists with language, executive function, reading. We all know kids who are less than five years old that will sit on the iPad like this all the time. It's scary, weird stuff, right? So um, I think in 20 years, is it going to be one of those things that we look back and say, like, what have we done? So right now, right now is a good time to be up top first. Everyone we're looking at their screens, eyes are going to be jacked up very soon. So, you can change the right? So, but, what have we, again, what have we done, right? It might be one of those questions, and again, yeah, that's kind of scary stuff. We'll skip that. Uh, nap stuff, naps are nice, they're decent, they feel good, okay? Um, pros and cons of napping. Pros is that you can get a alertness increase, right? You can get performance increases possibly. You can get a focus increase. Um, the cons of napping possibly is that it might mess with your schedule, your daily schedule. If you take a nap too late in the day, it's going to mess with your ability to go to sleep probably that night, which can impact the next day as well. If, that, if that's not you and you can take a nap during the day and you're totally fine going to bed at night, keep doing it. Perfect. Go ahead. No big deal. But if it does mess with you, then again, that's something that we have to kind of, you know, consider. If we have games, do we need to be focused and alert? Then yeah, we should probably take a nap. Or we just tired. So there's some suggestions that would say like, hey, just wait. Wait it out, uh, you know, maybe not take the nap so you can get back on schedule so then that night of sleep is pretty good, but then it'll keep your following days uh, sleep to be good. If you're doing it for focus, you know, and you don't want to mess up your sleep, then maybe just meditate for five minutes and see the uh, focus increase that might be able to get. All right, so this is the last one for here. 
Okay, so call for the future, at least this is for me. Right, so limited screen time in schools and for parents. Right, it's something that I think it's like one of those things where parents like give iPads and give phones to kids because it's their babysitter. We shouldn't do that. We've gone this, we've gone this long raising kids without iPads, it's probably, we're probably gonna be okay without it. Or we can be okay without it. I understand, I'm not a parent, so you know, speaking out of turn, I don't know. Assuming, I guess. But, uh, again, we shouldn't rely on those things to keep our kids active, or entertained. They take away, they get pissed off. Right, we don't want that. Okay, so, um, bring a bag of toys, have them play. People have been doing it forever, probably okay to still do it, right? So, um, because of what we talked about in brain development, it impacts it. Okay, also, you guys like this one. Naps in the workplace, naps in college, naps in training rooms. Why can't we do this? I don't know. <laughs> It'd be sweet if we had a designated nap area on campus, and maybe it's open from 11 to two o'clock, based on some of the stuff we already talked about. Increased performance, increases focus, increases ability to recall, stuff like that. I guarantee if you tell the university that, hey, the test scores are gonna go up, that they'll probably pay for it, right? So again, if you think about before a game, a lot of times people are tired and they have to rely on sleeping on the bus. They don't necessarily have to do that. It literally would take one room and like some cops and stuff and someone in there working it to make sure you spray it down and then you're good to go. They've done this at Michigan during like finals week where they'll have napping like areas in their library where people can go take a nap uh, pretty much at any point in time. So I think that's something that to think about um, in the future. <coughs> and then last one, like later school times. Right? We talked about development of the brain, we talked about kids needing sleep um, and stuff like that, but what happens? We go to bed or we go to school at, I don't know, when school start for everybody? 8 o'clock, 7.45. What time do we have to leave? What time do we have to get up in the morning? Do our parents commute to DC? Do our parents have to commute to Baltimore? When does the school bus leave? Right, there's some people that have to literally wake up and go on a school bus at 6 a.m. to get to school at 7 something and start class at 8. It's crazy. Right, so there's some cool stuff that looks at this, and there's some uh, examples of like places that have done this in the United States. And their test scores went up, their attendance went up, and like just more sleep time overall is going to be a good thing. Right, so for the developing brain, again, our brain isn't fully developed until we're 25, so we need as much sleep as possible leading up to that point. You can start school later. Um, it's going to be a big social change, obviously. But like, even going from 750 to 850 will probably make all the difference. And that's what they did, basically. They went from 7, I think it was like 755 to 850. And kids were sleeping like 30 minutes later. And test scores went up, attendance went up. Uh, driving accidents to school went down. So that's good, right? So some stuff there. Now, the last thing, again, we talked about a lot of the benefits, right? We talked about what's going to happen if you don't sleep well. If you don't sleep well tonight, don't sleep well every single day, no big deal. Not big deal. But it's when that starts to accumulate over time that it starts to become a problem. So there's actual, an actual sleep disorder that is that you worry about your quality of sleep so that you don't sleep. It sounds silly, I know. But that's an actual thing. So don't let that be you. Right? Understand that the benefit that this can have and how it can serve you. Uh, but if you have a bad night, you got a bad night. Make it better tomorrow. It's like anything else. You got a bad game, play better tomorrow. Bad practice, play better tomorrow. Same thing with this. So this stuff's super, super serious. Um, I hope you guys learned a couple things and things that we can do to help us out. Now the last thing that we'll do is on the back sheet of whatever paper that you had. We talked about We talked about this a little bit. Right, mental disorders, sleep disorders, and what's going on. So here's what I want you guys to do, because this will help, again, just getting it out. You don't have to share it with anybody, you don't have to talk to anybody, anything like that. But on the back sheet of paper, on a scratch sheet of paper, write down like any anxieties that you have about tomorrow, about the week, about the upcoming weeks. What are you worried about right now? Is it school? Is it a test? Is it this? Is it that? Is it your parents? Is it your girlfriend? So write down a couple things that are going to be on your mind that you probably know you're going to think about when it's 10 p.m. and you're ready to go to sleep. Okay, so you don't have to share it with anybody, but again, just get it out on paper, and that's going to make all the difference. Okay, so take a couple minutes to do that, and then uh, get out of
continue on. I'm going to be here uh, for the next probably 25 minutes. If you guys want to ask, come up and ask any questions, we can chit chat. But hey, I really appreciate you guys for being here. Um, hope you guys learned some cool stuff. And, uh,